I mean, I could have an idea in my head for five, six, seven years, all right? And I've kind of little by little been working out different things about it. The day that I sit down to do it, whatever is going on with me at the time will find its way into the piece. It has to, or the piece isn't worth making. If I was writing The Guns of the Navarone, all right, and then right, in the, right at the beginning of writing it or in the middle of writing it, I, I, I break up with my girlfriend who I'm like madly in love with and in my heart is, 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 is shattered, all right, that's got to work into it. Now, the story is still about a bunch of commandos going to blow up a couple of cannons, all right? But that pain that I'm feeling has got to find its way into this story or else, what am I doing? To me, all the movies are very personal. This group of friends will look at it and be like, oh, Quinn, I can't believe you talked about that. <laughs> you should be semi-embarrassed about certain people seeing your movie, I think, when you're finished, if you're working on a personal level. You should have this little voice inside of you saying, tell the truth. Yeah. Tell the truth, tell the truth. Yeah. All right, reveal a few secrets. And the in truth here. is your life experience. Exactly. That's, that's the truth as I know it. Right. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is, like any movie, about many different things. It's about the relationship between an actor and his stuntman. It's about a former TV star now struggling to adapt to a changing industry. It's about Los Angeles in the late 60s, and the culture shift that influenced the art and commerce of Hollywood. It's about New Hollywood's emergence and Old Hollywood's decline. As with all Tarantino films, it contains some musing on the director's own body of work as he approaches the self-imposed end of his career. All the shooting! <laughs> I love that stuff, you know, the killing. A lot of killing. Anybody order fried sauerkraut? And of course, it's about the infamous Manson family murders of Sharon Tate and her friends in the wee small hours of August 9th, 1969. Each of these things and many more have been dissected and discussed since the film's release. And while Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is certainly about all of these things, it struck me from the moment the credits first rolled that it was also obviously about something else. I think the core of the film is a reflection on a friendship and professional partnership spanning decades. A friendship that ended abruptly in the wake of Hollywood's greatest scandal, which is no small feat. That is, the relationship between Quentin Tarantino and his longtime producing partner and close friend, former Hollywood mogul and current New York State penitentiary inmate, Harvey Weinstein. I'm not saying it's only about this. It's clearly about other things too, and this could even be a purely subconscious edition. There's no way of knowing for sure without actually asking Tarantino. And even if I could, I'm not sure I'd want to. So what's going on here? <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, I just reject your hypotheses. What's going on here? Put that down. What's going on here? What are you doing? Yeah, that, well, you're, what you're saying is not correct. What are you doing? It's and I'm shutting your butt down. Yeah, because you're filming. Yeah. But if that was off, I'd be whipping your ass up and down this chair. Yeah. But given Tarantino and Weinstein's close relationship over the course of a quarter century, and given that the making of the film occurred reasonably soon after the allegations first came to light, I find it hard to believe that the matter didn't weigh heavy on Tarantino's mind and manifest in the material in some way, shape, or form. And just like when you buy a new car and you start to see it everywhere, the more you go looking for Harvey Weinstein-related subtext, the more you shall find. Want me to stop your car while driving? Rapid-fire Weinstein subtext interlude. The film's opening song is even called Treat Her Right, something that Weinstein definitely didn't do. The Al Pacino character, Dino De Laurentiis-inspired producer Marvin Schwarz, shares with Weinstein a commonly mispronounced last name. Schwarz, not Schwarz. Then again, I may be reading too deeply into it. But that's kind of the point. This is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, overanalyzed. <laughs> probably unnecessary to recap the laundry list of allegations and actual indictments leveled against Harvey Weinstein. Even if you don't know the specifics, you probably know that he did some pretty unpleasant stuff. And it turns out that almost everyone in Hollywood knew about it the whole time. Then Ronan Farrow, who is not Frank Sinatra's son, broke the story in a New Yorker article detailing accusations of sexual assault from a litany of Hollywood stars, 
Weinstein's name is on many of the mainstream films of the last 30 years that we all know and love, but his most notable projects are his productions of Quentin Tarantino's films. Weinstein, through his companies Miramax and The Weinstein Company, served as executive producer on every Tarantino film since Pulp Fiction, all the way up to and including The Hateful Eight. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is the first Tarantino film since Reservoir Dogs to be made without Weinstein's involvement. And while Tarantino was hailed as the overnight success, the boy wonder of the 90s independent film movement, Weinstein also enjoyed a meteoric rise. Before producing Pulp Fiction, Weinstein had spent 13 years financing films with such esteemed titles as The Pope Must Die. Tarantino's collaboration with Weinstein brought him a Pam d'Or and the freedom to make any movie he wanted. Weinstein's collaboration with Tarantino brought him a cool couple billion dollars and propelled him from being just another independent film producer to cementing his place as a Hollywood mogul. On televised award shows, Hollywood royalty made sure to pay tribute, meekly referring to Weinstein as God. I just want to thank my agent, Kevin Uvain, and God, Harvey Weinstein. The success of one contributed to the success of the other. They rose in tandem, from relative obscurity in the world of independent film, to reach the very top of the Hollywood hierarchy. The heroes of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood also found their success by each other's side. Rick and Cliff are like a much less successful version of Tarantino and Weinstein. Rick is like Tarantino, the famous one, the temperamental artist. Producers and stuntmen don't have all that much in common, but Cliff Booth and Harvey Weinstein both perform similar functions for their star counterparts, supporting them in work and in life. There are some obvious superficial differences between Rick Dalton and Quentin Tarantino. One of them looks like a movie star, one of them definitely doesn't. There are some superficial similarities too both married later in life, Rick to an Italian actress and Quentin to an Israeli singer. More importantly, they occupy the same professional world. While Rick is an actor and Quentin a writer-director, these are both artistic professions that go hand in hand. Tarantino even learned about writing and directing first as an actor, and has even done some acting himself. Shut up, Black! Rick is a TV actor, but he's not just a haircut or a block of wood in a soap opera. He's talented, and as we find out from his guest appearance on Lancer, he's a real artist when he wants to be. That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. Rick fucking no. Rick is sensitive, easy to upset, and quick to anger. Yeah, there is some evidence that Tarantino too shares this trait. Oh, oh, oh. Cliff's job on Bounty Law was to fall off horses and do whatever it took to make Rick look cool. As a stuntman, he was supposed to insulate Rick from harm by putting himself in harm's way. But really, Cliff's job was to make Rick look like the action hero he was pretending to be. He gave Jake Cahill credibility that was integral to Rick's fame and success. He did the unpleasant things Rick couldn't or wouldn't do, but that had to be done in order to make television history. What, carrying his load? Hit him with the fucking Lincoln! Writer-directors obviously don't have stunt doubles, but the comparable duties are performed by producers or financiers who take care of the commercial side of things so that a director, like Tarantino, can focus on the art. A stunt double protects their actor from the risk of physical harm or danger. A financier, like Weinstein, basically takes care of the boring but important stuff that is as fundamental to the making of a film as a script. Weinstein gave Tarantino a blank check, and Tarantino was able to focus solely on his films. He never had to make any script changes due to budget constraints. He never had to compromise his vision to please the studio. He had, and still has, total creative control and a virtually unlimited budget a unique situation for any filmmaker to enjoy for nearly 30 years. A lot of that was made possible, at least initially, by Weinstein. Years after Bounty Law, Cliff struggles to find work as a stuntman, even for Rick. More on that in a moment. But rather than going their separate ways some eight years after the show ended, Rick and Cliff remain practically joined at the hip. Rick no longer needs Cliff as a stuntman, but he does need Cliff as a friend. In fact, Rick is almost entirely dependent upon Cliff, not just to drive him to work or to fix his TV aerial, these are just the jobs he invents to keep Cliff around. Cliff's real use is in those moments when Rick feels most insecure. When he doubts his ability, his career, his prospects, he needs Cliff to pick him up hey. and to remind him that he's a star. You're Rick fucking dumb. At a certain point, Tarantino could have worked with any producer, studio, or financier in the world and maintained his artistic integrity, as evidenced by the massive deal he got from Sony to make this film. But he always chose to work with Weinstein. Cliff has been all but blacklisted as a stuntman. Wherever he goes, he's followed by a rumour that makes him so toxic that, but for Rick's insistence, he's practically been run out of the business altogether. The dude killed his fucking wife. Cliff is effectively banned from stunt work because of the rumour that he killed his wife with a harpoon. This is oddly reminiscent of a tragic piece of Hollywood lore, the death of actress Natalie Wood, 
who drowned after falling over the side of a boat she was on with her husband, Robert Wagner, and their possible threesome partner, Christopher Walken. Up his ass. The circumstances of her death are, like that of Cliff's wife, a little mysterious. The official story is that she drowned, but how? Did she fall, or was she pushed? It's purposefully unclear whether Cliff killed his wife deliberately, or as the result of a drunken accident. Regardless, people believe he did it, and they don't want him on their set. Just as this rumour follows Cliff around, stories of Harvey Weinstein's abusive and predatory behaviour circulated widely in the industry, long before the general public knew. Congratulations, you five ladies no longer have to pretend to be attracted to Harvey Weinstein. Nobody said or did anything because they were silenced, intimidated, or it was too lucrative to maintain the status quo. And many people simply dismissed these stories as baseless rumours. Rick is just as sceptical of the rumours about Cliff. You, you don't believe that old shit, do you? Though there are some similarities between Cliff Booth and Harvey Weinstein, there are some stark differences too, not the least of which are physical. Weinstein, until his arrest, lived a life of excess, partying it up with the fellow rich and powerful, buying mansions and penthouses, super yachting in the south of France, and donating generously to presidential candidates. His net worth at his peak was perhaps as much as $300 million, yet he never stopped lusting after more money, power, women, and food. Cliff lives in a trailer behind a drive-in movie theatre in the San Fernando Valley, quite literally on the dark side of the Hollywood sign. He eats powdered macaroni and cheese straight from the pan, yet he seems completely content. Where Weinstein solicits sexual favours or uses force, Cliff asks for ID. He got some ID, you know, like a driver's license or something. And while these differences seem to blow any notion of a comparison between the two out of the water, they are actually at the heart of the connection between Cliff Booth and Harvey Weinstein. They exist because Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is, as the title suggests, a fairy tale. The fairy tales of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are not the children's stories we all know of knights, dragons, and damsels in distress. For Tarantino, who grew up in Los Angeles and was obsessed with cinema from a young age, Hollywood is the fairy tale. The houses of the Hollywood Hills are like vast castles, isolating their modern day royalty from the rabble without. Rick doesn't have a gated property, and he has plenty of problems. But behind the wrought iron of the Polanski residence or the Playboy Mansion, the beautiful people drink, dance, and are merry, seemingly free from the troubles beyond the walls. Even the Playboy Mansion is not depicted as it really was, or at least as we think of it nowadays. Instead of showing us the grotty grotto, the dark side of the now infamous Pleasure Palace, Hugh Hefner's house is the epicenter of cool in the coolest epoch of human history. Sharon Tate is the princess in the tower, the damsel who doesn't yet know she's in distress. Rather than literal giants, the mythical figures of the Hollywood fairy tale are the icons of this period. The casual presence of Steve McQueen, Bruce Lee, and even Roman Polanski, in minor, somewhat inconsequential roles, adds to the magic of the affair. The Manson family, the film's de facto villains, are one-dimensional, rotten to the core, and without any redeeming qualities. They are the fairy tale monsters, the classic Hollywood bad guys that we're not supposed to have any empathy for. They follow in the tradition of Indians, bandits, gangsters, terrorists, and stormtroopers. The differences between Cliff Booth and Harvey Weinstein are the result of this use of Hollywood fairy tale. Cliff is one of the story's heroes, and Hollywood heroes don't have real flaws. Tarantino takes the very worst elements of his real-life friend, the qualities that make Weinstein an almost cartoon villain, and effectively gives them the Hollywood treatment transforming Weinstein into a character that closely resembles a classic Hollywood hero. The fat and seriously grotesque Harvey Weinstein is replaced by two-time People magazine's sexiest man alive, Brad Pitt. The weak-chinned sexual predator becomes a handsome leading man, a masculine ideal in the mould of John Wayne, Gary Cooper, Steve McQueen, and Clint Eastwood. Both is quiet, confident, cool, and he can beat up pretty much anyone. And he worked in westerns just as the aforementioned screen legends earned their iconic status playing the stoic cowboys and gunslingers that define the archetypal Hollywood hero to this day. Even long after the deserts of the West ceased to be the main setting for Hollywood films, Hollywood heroes continued to basically be cowboys. Han Solo, Indiana Jones, John McClane, Dirty Harry, Rambo, Aragorn, every character Will Smith has ever played except himself, the hero in every war film, the gruff detective from every other thriller, and even the men in tights that masquerade as heroes in the theme park movies that masquerade as cinema. Today. The Hollywood fairy tale continues by giving us the defining trope of both Hollywood films and fairy tales, a happily ever after ending. Tarantino gives real life a rewrite, and gives us the kind of fairy tale ending we expect from Hollywood films by saving Sharon Tate. Instead of seeing her butchered by the Manson family, Tate, her unborn baby, and her friends survive, and they will never even know they were the Manson family's original targets. Sharon Tate has almost nothing to do with the plot of this film until the very end. She's really there to create suspense. 
If we know what happened to her, we assume that Rick and Cliff, being her neighbours as well as main characters, are on some kind of collision course with the night of her murder. The handful of scenes where we do see Sharon Tate show her as practically glowing. Not only is she a beautiful actress on the verge of stardom, the it girl of her day, but she's kind, generous, warm, and full of joy. It's not a particularly nuanced role, but it isn't supposed to be realistic. It's a tribute to her memory. Because no matter how bubbly or vivacious she might be, it's hard not to look at her without a tinge of sadness in the knowledge of her impending demise. For those who went to the movie unaware of her fate, I would suppose they had a totally different experience watching this film. For the rest of us, the presence of Sharon Tate is accompanied by a sense of dread. She always reminds us of what is about to be lost. Sharon Tate represents the many victims of Harvey Weinstein. He took advantage of women just like her, young, perhaps a little naive, and intoxicated by the Hollywood dream. The act of Sharon Tate's murder by the Manson family represents Weinstein's abuse, a terrible act of indiscriminate violence that destroyed someone completely innocent. And so to save Sharon Tate, to prevent her death, is the metaphorical equivalent of saving Weinstein's victims. Preventing her murder is akin to preventing Weinstein's abuse. Who saves Sharon Tate is just as important. While Cliff takes care of most of the Manson family, he's not ultimately responsible for saving her. She's actually saved by Rick. At around midnight, when Cliff goes for a walk with his acid-dipped cigarette, Rick's margarita making is interrupted by a loud car outside. He storms out to confront the driver and yells at them until they drive away. It's in that moment he inadvertently saves Sharon Tate's life. The Manson family gather their thoughts and decide to kill Rick instead. And Sharon Tate will never even know that she was supposed to die. Rick does something we have all been urged to do in the wake of the Weinstein scandal and the countless others that followed. He essentially does what might be referred to in Me Too parlance as speaking up. He doesn't do it with noble intentions, but the result is effectively the same. He makes enough of a fuss to prevent something truly terrible from happening. Rick does what Tarantino failed to do. The loud rumblings of Tex Watson's car are like the many rumours of Weinstein's behaviour that Tarantino ignored over the years. Tex's car is missing a muffler, Rick comments on it. Next time you want to try that, fix your fucking muffler! Just as the stories of Weinstein's abuse were not muffled, they were an open secret joked about at the Oscars. Tarantino admitted after the fact that he heard these stories and that he downplayed them. On the other hand, Rick doesn't even give it a moment's thought before going head to head with a crew of would-be mass murderers. In this respect, Rick is the hero Tarantino never was. Saving Sharon Tate is Tarantino acknowledging his failures. It's an admission of his guilt, to whatever extent he's responsible. It's an expression of remorse, of regret, much different to the fantasy revenge killing of Hitler in Inglorious Bastards. Rewriting the past in this case is deeply personal. It's his way of saying, if I could only go back and do things differently. After fighting off the Manson family with a can of dog food and a rotary phone, and after making his statement to the police, a wounded Cliff is wheeled to an ambulance. Rick wants to follow him to the hospital, but Cliff tells him not to bother. Prior to the surprise hippie invasion, Rick and Cliff were celebrating their last night together. Rick is married now, and he can't afford to keep Cliff around. It's the end of an era. So tonight was their big, drunken send-off. Their parting now takes on extra significance. Rather than a simple see you later, this feels more like goodbye. The imagery of Cliff on the stretcher is eerily reminiscent of this famous photo that graced the front page following the Tate murders. Whether or not this alludes to Cliff's death, this moment is final. It's the end of Rick and Cliff's friendship. Just before Cliff is taken away, hey. Rick musters up the courage to tap on the glass and say, You're a good friend, Cliff. I tried. This is his way of thanking Cliff, not just for saving his life tonight, but for all of his help throughout the years. Maybe he understands on some level that this could be the last time they see each other. Rick's parting words to Cliff are also Tarantino's farewell to Weinstein. In their goodbye, he recognises Weinstein's impact on his life and career. After Cliff has been carted off, Rick meets Jay Sebring, who's come down from the Polanski residence to see what all the commotion was about. They speak through the gate, Rick's still an outsider. He discovers that Sharon Tate is a fan, and her voice miraculously floats over the intercom, inviting him up for a drink. Finally, the gates swing open, and Rick climbs the hill. Rick meeting Sharon Tate marks his ascension to the new Hollywood elite. Tate is married to Roman Polanski, so all doors are now open to Rick. His legacy is secure and his place in the industry cemented. All concerns about his career are now over. And Rick would never have met Sharon Tate without Cliff. Rick's ascension is Tarantino's acknowledgement of the impact Weinstein had on his career. Without Weinstein's help, without his financial backing and the security of total creative freedom, 
Tarantino may be like Rick, struggling to break out of middling roles after an early success and making cheap B-movies. Or he might even be like Cliff. Instead, he has a house in the Hollywood Hills, a swimming pool, and a legendary career. But of all the things you could say about a convicted sexual predator, the choice of good friend is an odd one. Tarantino tells us that, despite all of the horrible things he's done, Weinstein was a good friend to him. But why is a nuanced understanding of Weinstein's character important? Tarantino offers it as an explanation. He was essentially blinded by friendship. He remakes Weinstein as Cliff Booth in the mold of a classic Hollywood hero to show us that he looked up to Weinstein, that he idealized him. He shows us the good side of Weinstein as a warning, so that we don't make the same mistake he did. Cliff is a relic of old Hollywood, of a simplistic world that deals in good and evil, heroes and villains as always distinct. Rick, on the other hand, begins as an old Hollywood actor but evolves into a new Hollywood thespian. He leaves the world of bounty law behind for good, ditching his ambitions to return to the screen as a hero and finally embracing the role of the heavy on Lancer. Then he jets off to Europe to make decidedly non-Hollywood films. He stars in spaghetti westerns, a subversion of the genre that made him famous, where the good guys are often indistinguishable from the bad ones. On returning home, he ascends to the new Hollywood elite, while Cliff is left behind. Tarantino's mistake was to view Weinstein like an old Hollywood hero. We should leave this way of thinking behind, as Cliff is left behind. Instead, like Rick, we should ascend to adopt the more nuanced perspective found in the new Hollywood films. A world of anti-heroes and flawed protagonists, a world that isn't always just or fair, where the good guys don't always win and the bad guys often get away with it. A world that better reflects the one we live in. In other words, if we only expect bad guys to behave like the villains in Hollywood movies, we will miss the real-life monsters. We must be most vigilant about our heroes, and the people that play them on TV. The last we see of Cliff, separated from Rick by a frame within a frame, he's whisked away by the ambulance. His fate, taken away in restraints accompanied by flashing lights, echoes Weinstein's. As Rick greets the still-living Sharon Tate, we have our happy ending, though not for long. The title comes on screen, and the words once upon a time bring us right back to reality. Our happy ending becomes bittersweet, infused with the sad memory of what really happened to Sharon Tate. Whatever catharsis Tarantino might achieve from rewriting history, from correcting his mistakes, it's temporary. The moment the credits roll, the fantasy is over. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, I'm impressed. I nearly didn't. I hope it was worth your time. This is the first in a series of video essays I'm making, so if you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Future topics for video essays include, but are not limited to, theme park movies, an insult to theme parks, Alfred Hitchcock, master of suspense, pervert in disguise, and on The Godfather, why does Sonny have such a big dick, and what kind of equipment is Fredo working with? Please let me know your thoughts on this video essay in the comments. I'll answer any and all rebuttals to my theory. And if you have any suggestions for video essay topics, feel free to post them there too. Thanks again for watching, see you next time.